we, we started five years ago. We actually started the day after the earthquake happened. Uh, I was personally in, in, in Tokyo at that time. And um, it is an event, I think, for, for many of us uh, in Japan is something we will never forget. Everybody has their own personal stories and experiences. And uh, that kind of brought us together. Uh, today, I want to talk a little bit about before March 11th. What and how did radiation measurement look like? And we call that the before safe cost area, the BS area. And uh, uh, we have done some research and we, we, we tried to find some, you know, how did people do uh, radiation surveys? This is a sailor in the 1940s using a, uh, at that time, a high-end uh, Geiger counter uh, to, uh, to measure radiation on a dock. Uh, this is kind of the earliest pictures we have found of, uh, uh, in this case, a military doing a mobile survey using a car to, to measure radiation. And we're going to skip a little bit. This is the 1950s. We're going to skip to the, to the 2009. This is uh, the Japanese government's official radiation measurement vehicle. It's a very big car with tremendous amount of equipment in it. And this, is, this car is able to do mobile radiation surveys. Um, worldwide, there are various networks that monitor radiation. And um, one of the networks that is uh, global uh, has uh, monitoring stations. And you can get an idea of the size and scale of these monitoring stations, very big installations, but you can also imagine that, that there's only very few of these. Um, if we look at March uh, 11th, some of these measuring statements generated all kind of data like this. And when we, uh, when we woke up to the disaster and we started to look at our news channels to find out what was happening, uh, some of this data uh, was there, but none of it made any sense to anybody. We were looked at it and we, we don't know what this means. Uh, TEPCO was very quick out to walk around with Geiger counters. We saw that on television. Um, uh, they were measuring the air here. Uh, as you can see, a very manual process. Uh, this is the US military uh, measuring in, in, in Japan. You can see uh, they're using a clipboard, one guy with a clipboard and one guy with a Geiger counter. Actually, the, the model looks very similar to the one in the 1940s, if you look carefully. And uh, so very manual operation. So, um, and, uh, one of the first kind of published radiation maps after the accident was done by the Japanese government. And this map was created by, by hand. So people drove around in a car and would stop at specific locations and take an actual measurement. And some of these areas here were pretty high. So you can also imagine that this wasn't without, but without risk to do. But this is how, how things started just after the accident. Uh, the US government actually had uh, the best equipment and they were out almost immediately after the accident with a helicopter with a very um, sensitive measurement system. And with that measurement system, actually kind of the first um, uh, mobile survey was done of Fukushima. And this, is, this was actually done in the first week after the accident. Uh, most of this data never came to us. It took about three, four months after the accident until this was kind of published officially through the Japanese government. And it took a year or so after that before this data was publicly available. But um, one of the most uh, earliest uh, radiation maps that actually had uh, uh, quite some coverage and texture. Uh, as you may have heard, the Japanese government had its own system called Speedy. This was a system that was installed around Japan. Uh, lots of measurement posts to measure radiation. And the system was designed to predict where a plume would go in case of a nuclear disaster. And uh, if you look carefully, this is... Um, um, March 18, 2011, just shortly after the accident, and you can see that in Fukushima, Miyagi, uh, the system was down. So it was uh, it malfunctioned, and it was uh, not used during the accident. It did create some data. It actually did pro uh, it actually did predict where the plume was going, but because there were doubts about the system, uh, people didn't use this data, and because it wasn't used, uh, uh, people that were evacuated out of the, the zone near the power plant, were evacuated, in some cases, to areas that were higher than where they were coming from. So uh, important side note here is, is that uh, all of this data came to us way, way later. None of this was publicly available, so uh, it was actually, therefore, of no, uh, no use. Uh, this is a picture I took myself on uh, uh, April 22nd, 2011. And this uh, had to do with the fact that we were about to go to uh, Fukushima ourselves to go and measure. And um, this was NHK, uh, NHK News. Okay. Um, okay, it's good? Okay, we're good. Okay, this was NHK News. And um, Tokyo is here, and uh, Fukushima is here, right? 
And unfortunately, they had to put a label on it so you couldn't see the radiation levels in Fukushima. Uh, you could see the Tochigi can, which is next to Fukushima, 0.2 microsieverts. And I kind of thought, okay, 0.2 microsieverts, you know, that's maybe uh, two times what it was in Tokyo, or three times. So that was kind of the, the, the expectation we were, we're having when we were going up there. So let's focus on safe costs. So what, what, what did we do? So you, you get an idea of what was happening. Basically, there was no real information when we started. Whatever we, we touched was of um, extreme limited use. And uh, because we couldn't find the information we wanted, the initial thought we had was to uh, kind of collect information that was out there and try to put it in one location and then share it with the rest of the world. Uh, we did try to do that, actually. We put a website up, we put a made a map, we collected the data. Uh, and very quickly became clear is, is that, that the data that was available was primarily around Tokyo, research institutes, governments, etc. Or the data was copyright protected, so we couldn't copy it. Or very easily speaking, there was just no data. In, in Fukushima Prefecture or whatever, there was simply nothing available. Um, we wandered around for about four weeks after the accident trying to figure out how can we get a good grip on radiation levels. And uh, we did uh, very early on a crowd uh, funding uh, on Kickstarter where we wanted to collect money to buy a couple of hundred Geiger counters in the hope to distribute these Geiger counters to people in Fukushima and then hand collect data, uh, accumulate the data and publish it. And uh, we did, we were very successful with the Kickstarter campaign in getting the money. But by the time we had done that, we realized that Geiger counters that were sold out in, in the early days of the accident, the lead time had grown from six months to 12 months. So even though we, we had money to buy Geiger counters, the lead time meant that you know, by the time we were able to get the equipment, uh, it's way, way too late. So uh, we had a few Geiger counters that were donated to us around uh, the, the second week after the accident. So about five or six Geiger counters. And uh, we came together in Tokyo uh, in April, and the idea came to say that if we can do something like a Google Street View where we drive in a car with our Geiger counter and we automatically collect uh, the data and then somehow kind of create a picture of radiation and we map that out, we can maybe use these few Geiger counters in a very, very efficient manner. So, um, so what we did is, is that we said, okay, in order to do that, let's get lots of people together. Uh, we started to uh, connect through the internet, uh, we connected worldwide experts, people on hardware, on software, people on community, also experts on radiation, radiation health, and uh, various people that could uh, uh, contribute to making uh, this idea happen. Uh, so we decided to do something different because um, you, you may have seen in the, in the earlier picture, you know, the, the equipment that was available to do radiation uh, mobile mapping involved the mini bus with tremendous amount of expensive equipment. So we said, you know, that's not going to work. We have to do a little bit different. So we said, okay, what we're going to do different is we're going to use <clears throat> what we can find in our uh, uh, in our kitchen. We found some duct tape, and uh, what we did is uh, at that time we had a group of uh, students from K University that were uh, going to go up to Kesenuma to help out with uh, setting up infrastructure after the disaster. And we asked them to, this, to put this Geiger counter, this is a Geiger counter, and you see lots of duct tape. And what we did is, is they taped the Geiger counter outside the car on the wind, on the car wind, outside. And uh, so from the inside, they could see the radiation level. And we asked them to take a picture every, you know, uh, every 30 minutes or so with, with their mobile phone. And because the mobile phone keeps track of where a picture is taken, it automatically would give us the radiation level plus a location coordinate. So, and that resulted kind of in our first experimental map. And uh, so this is basically where they took pictures and for each picture we could click on this and you could see the, the, the photo with the radiation level. And we got an idea as to kind of how, how levels were changing. So as we were testing this out, we started to build a system that could automate what the students were doing with their camera. So this is that first system. This is what uh, became to know as the BGAIGI, the Bento Geiger counter system. And if you look carefully, you see this is the system that we use some duct tape to protect it against water. But the idea was is to put it on the car window, make it shockproof and make it um, uh, weatherproof so that we could drive it around without uh, worrying about the equipment uh, getting broken. It had a computer uh, that had the software to basically read out the information on the Geiger counter every five seconds. And this system uh, we built, uh, and the first test drive was on uh, April 
uh, 24th to, uh, uh, to Koryama. Actually, Watanabe-san, who is here today from Koryama, he was the person uh, who we uh, visited it as uh, one of the goals of the trip. So here you can see how the Geiger counters are mounted on, uh, on the car, actually in this case two. And it sits, it sits very uh, solidly on the car window, but it was designed so that we could remove and attach that to the car literally in 10 seconds. Very, very easy to do. Um, so we said, okay, let's go to Fukushima. Um, so we initially thought that after the nuclear disaster, we should uh, go buy electrical cars. So we got some sponsor in Tokyo that uh, gladfully landed is an electrical car, a very nice one. And we got lots of volunteers, as you can see, that were very happy to drive up, up there. Um, unfortunately, this is five years ago. The charging stations uh, didn't uh, exist uh, uh, in, in Tohoku, so we couldn't really go up with this car. So we said, maybe we should go by bicycle. Uh, so, but you know, it's 400 kilometers, so I said, forget that. Um, so we ended up uh, using a conventional car, uh, which was donated to us, the safe cost car, and uh, this is what we used to go uh, to Fukushima from Tokyo. Uh, on April 24th, we, uh, we went to uh, Koryama. Uh, we stopped there, we went to visit uh, Watanabe-san, and with Watanabe-san's help, we uh, started to measure uh, things uh, of you know what people are worried about. Basically, yourself, your 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 friends, then the school, the workplace, your house. So, and that became our first measurement. Now, what happened was is that on April 22nd, when I was watching TV, I kind of thought, oh, this is going to be maybe around 0 0.2 microsieverts. But when we entered Koryama, we realized that one, the level were way higher than what we we were kind of expecting. But also what we immediately saw is, is that because of the, the nature of the fallout, it's very unpredictable what level you measure uh, in one street versus the other street. And that became our kind of our big discovery as we were walking through the city and we were measuring, we started to realize that this is uh, something that is way harder to measure than we thought. We thought, you know, maybe the distance gives us an indicator, but it was very, very different. Uh, here you can see this is a school that we measured at around two microsieverts per hour at that time. And this is hard to see, but this is a shoe of, of a friend of Watanabe Sons and was about half microsievert per hour that we measured on the shoe. So you, you can get, kind of get an idea as to what, what, uh, what, what happened then. Now, um, we also uh, realized that the area that is affected, Koryama is about 60, 70 kilometers from Daiichi. So we're talking about a huge area. So how do we measure that? So we, we started to realize that uh, we can't do that uh, with the system we had built because it had a computer, it was kind of uh, uh, up and spoke. And more importantly, uh, driving from Tokyo to, to Fukushima wasn't, uh, wasn't going wasn't gonna to work. So we said we need to build something so that we can give it to many, many people that then can go measure it. So the next thing we did is, is we rebuilt the system and we made it self-contained. So you can see it here. This, you know, we removed the computer and we put the computer inside the, uh, inside the bento box so that it became a self-contained system that basically didn't need any instruction manual to be operated. So as we achieved that, we could now suddenly uh, give this to people uh, in, in affected areas, primarily Fukushima, so that they could start measuring their cities. This is literally the first version of that, and uh, this is in Iwaki City where two volunteers uh, took it on themselves to basically measure every street in that city. Uh, not only were we able to help people uh, in, in cities, we also started to help researchers. This is a researcher from Tokyo University that was using the clipboard and the Geiger counter to measure radiation in the exclusion zone. And uh, by using the system we had developed, he could not actually walk around, uh, take much less risk for himself, but also take much more measurements than he could, could do on his own uh, manually. Uh, we got help from uh, various uh, uh, companies. Uh, this is a very famous company. And uh, they started to use uh, our equipment as well. So we got more and more participation of individuals, researchers, companies, and uh, local governments to start measuring. Uh, there's a person in the back of the room who knows what this picture is about. <laughs> so we also have done all kinds of other experiments, including using drones and other um, vehicles to, to measure with. <laughs> okay, so what? So the end result of this is is that we got more and more people to to um, uh, to participate, and we started to get closer to our goal. Uh, we really wanted to measure everything in Japan. Uh, we had obviously lots of people that were concerned about their their safety in Fukushima itself. Uh, the government at that time 
restricted most of their measurements to the exclusion zone, and measurements outside of that were very, very cursory. So we made it our goal to measure every single street. But we did it also for Tokyo. We also did it for south of Japan and Hokkaido. Uh, it didn't really matter. People were worried in general, and it became important for people to, to know what it was around their uh, areas, even though later on we found out that uh, large parts of Japan were not affected. The only way to know that is to go and measure that. So that's what we really, uh, we really set out to do. What it helped people to do is, is because our, our maps show radiation at a, at a very granular level, uh, these are uh, two uh, evacuees from, the, uh, from the, the zone near Daiichi. And uh, this is, I think this was in Aizu, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, they were evacuated to Aizu, and they're uh, using our map to see what the levels are in, uh, near, their, uh, near, the, near their house. So it became possible for people to see uh, what happened. As we were building bigaigis um, to measure uh, radiation uh, uh, all over Japan, we also got a tremendous amount of interest from outside of Japan. People started to call us and say, we want the bigaigi, and can you get us one? Our energy and our means were limited to Japan uh, at that time. And uh, we had another problem, is, is that the equipment we were building uh, wasn't, uh, it wasn't so straightforward to build many of them. So we came up with the idea to, uh, uh, to make an, a new Big Aigi, which is now called the Big Aigi Nano. Uh, the key thing of this device is that you can build it yourself. So we made it a kit, so you can get all the parts and you, build, you can build your own. Uh, Geiger counter system. So that uh, then opened up the way for us to organize workshops where we got people together, where we build the Big Aigi together, and then people could learn how to use it. They could also, they would know how to repair it. We would teach people how to solder if you wouldn't know how to solder. And this uh, kicked off the second kind of wave of Big Aigis uh, that we put out. Uh, we started this about three years ago. And uh, we have done uh, many, many, many workshops uh, ever since. And we have uh, more than 500 of these now in existence worldwide. Um, we did some further innovation on that. Our initial big IG systems used SD cards. And you needed to take the SD card out of the system and upload the data. Um, uh, this year, uh, we are, uh, launched a, a Bluetooth option. So you can use a mobile phone, uh, Android or, or Apple device to do uh, the uploading, and we hope that it uh, makes it easier for, for people to, to participate in the project. Uh, so what that did is, is that when we started with a few Geiger counters in, uh, in March 2011, uh, today it's uh, March uh, 2016, and uh, literally a few days ago we passed 43 million measurements that we have uh, collected worldwide. A uh, good part in Japan and an increasingly large part also outside of Japan. We're doing more than a million uh, data points uh, a month right now. And actually last week was a very special week. We did about a million in, in less than a week's time uh, due to some extremely active volunteers uh, in some, some parts of, the, of our planet. So here you can get an idea of where we are in terms of measuring the planet. Uh, first statement we have, we have done great largely we have covered Japan. We have tremendous amount of activity in Taiwan. Uh, Europe has been very, very active recently, and the US has been very active from, uh, from very early on. And these are all volunteers that have built their own big IGs and are measuring with that. And they're starting to map out cities and starting to map out their environments. So I want to spend a few minutes to talk about uh, how the data actually looks like. And uh, Asbi, if you can uh, help me a little bit. Uh, yes, yes, start with that. So, uh, as part of the Safe Cost project, we have lots of teams that do different things. Uh, some of the uh, amazing work uh, that has been done by one of our volunteers is the actual visualization of the data. Our data set has grown tremendously, and, uh, and there's, you know, how, how do we, uh, how do we show what what is happening? And okay, um, we're going to improvise a little bit. Yes. Can we? Give it a shot. Eyes closed. It is working. Better, way better. Okay. Um, yes. Hmm? Are you on the right app or kill it? Try it again. All right, 
Um, what, what we're going to do is, is we're going to step through the data set that we, uh, we collected. This is, uh, can you go just go all the way to 2011? This is, my, you know, this is the first three months uh, of data we measured in the first three months after the accident started. This was done by only a few big IGs at that time. Uh, let's go to, let's slowly step through. This is, uh, step, you know, six months after the accident and then we go on and on. Let's just go through. So if you look very carefully, if we just focus on the areas around Fukushima, Koreyama here, very slowly you will see that the radiation, the colors are coming down. Blue is basically low background uh, levels and lighter blue and uh, yellow and red uh, and upwards indicate higher levels. Um, so maybe it's interesting if we can zoom in uh, in 2011, if we can go, uh, if we, maybe, yeah, Koreyama. So this this is, this is the data we took literally in the first weeks uh, after the accident. And if you switch on the, uh, the uh, tools, query rectangle, yeah, okay. So, so as, as uh, Osby is moving around, uh, and maybe you can move around a little bit more because what is interesting is you will see that the radiation levels are, are, are flipping from half microsieverts to one and a half microsieverts, et cetera. So this was very typical for what we found. So not, uh, you know, over very short distances, you can see the radiation, the radiation levels change. So what we want to do now is, is we want to go and hop in time and go where we roughly are today. Uh, let's see if we have, yeah. So, and then move it around, yep, yeah, okay. So, so what you could see is, is we're, we're, we were around zero, a half microsievert, 1.5 microsieverts in this area here. And today we're in, you know, 0 0.15, 0 0.2. So there's a, a, a significant roll off of, of the radiation levels uh, as we measure them t today. This obviously is good news uh, for everybody uh, living here. And uh, we, we have been working and studying as to what are the, the reasons for this. And uh, we can talk about it a little bit later as we talks about it. Hmm? Yes. yes, we're going to, this is Fukushima city itself. This is 2000, um, uh, you know, first six months after the accident. Uh, you can also, you know, if you look carefully, you see that the color, there's quite some color changes on the, on the edges and, and, and things. And now we're going to flip to where it is today. So you see, this is 2013, and then this is where it stands roughly today. So as you can see, um, and you need to wiggle it around a little bit. Yep, okay. Yeah, all right, so here we can kind of see. So, so in general, uh, for, for many uh, areas like Fukushima City or Koreyama, levels have come down quite a bit. Part of that has to do with the half-life of uh, cesium that, uh, and cesium-134, a major component of that, and other parts have to do with how uh, wear and tear happens over five years in terms of material slowly being uh, eroded and, uh, and, and disappear into the groundwater system. A lot of things have to do with some of the material actually sinks into the ground and gets shielded more, so you measure less, but it doesn't mean there is less material out there. So this is um, what we measuring today. So you can, and if you go use our maps, you can literally take any area and you can study that. Um, shall we zoom out? Uh, let's go to the other app. The, or actually, no, sorry, 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 let's go to Europe and then do the same time, time slider. This wanted to show, um, you know, the, the, this is 2011, we had no measurements in Europe, but Asby is gonna flip us through uh, some of the earlier measurements and only very recently people started to connect to our project and that resulted in significant amount of measurements coming out of Europe today. Yes, so these are, yeah, what you see here is these are the measurements taken in three months time frames, right? So that's why you see, you know, there's differences. This is just not accumulated. This is within in one three month, three month bucket, how many people measured. So we have more and more people that participate for all kinds of reasons. As you know, uh, Europe uh, had Chernobyl uh, uh, disaster uh, 30 years ago. There are still lots of people that are worried about that and they actually want to go and measure. So we have quite a few volunteers doing that. There's other people that uh, are worried about specific uh, uh, you know, uh, accidents or things that happened, uh, Chernobyl is, is a part of that. And we have the same thing in the US where there is natural occurring radiation quite a bit, uh, like uranium mines, there's also uh, a long history of nuclear testing and, and various things that happen. And there is quite some uh, pull from uh, our volunteers to, to measure for that reason. Um, shall we go back to, no, just do the presentation, I think this is fine. Uh, so, so what is important is is that uh, uh, by by measuring 
uh, you that's the only way to to figure out what what really uh, what really happens and uh, that has been the uh, one of the key elements of of how safe cost has kind of discovered itself and i want to spend a few minutes about uh, having uh, uh, having been a volunteer uh, at safe cost what are kind of the the ways we kind of have organized ourselves how come you know we've been able to make this happen and what are some of the, uh, the elements in this? Before that, actually, as we are showing something, <laughs> we this, this is this is kind of a weird map. This map is being done with our system uh, flying uh, 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 at 10,000 meters. This is uh, the radiation you get in an airplane between various big cities in the world. So you, you typically get between three to five microsieverts an hour if you're in an airplane. And if you look carefully, the the, the, the more north you fly, the, the higher it gets because there's less at atmosphere protecting you well. If you're on the south axis, uh, you're, you get less. So we we're, we're kind of have uh, talked about this and we're in the process to publish these maps as a separate map uh, for people that are interested in and how much radiation do you get if you take an airplane. Okay, Osby, thank you very much. Then, yes. Um, yes, okay, sorry. Um, so. The, the mapping exercise was a great way for us to understand uh, kind of roughly what, what happened. And we, though we, our volunteers measure regularly, there's quite some time interval between the same location getting measured again and again. Uh, so about uh, two years ago, uh, we got um, a request from some of our volunteers that wanted to measure continuously the radiation levels in a specific location to actually confirm for themselves if is it really coming down as what is being told. And how is that coming down? And can, can I see that? The other reason for that was some people were worried that there were, there were continuous releases coming from Fukushima Daiichi. Is that actually happening? And, and how would I know about that? So we decided to build a system that uh, used uh, stationary uh, sensors uh, to, um, to, measure, uh, uh, to measure radiation. OK. Um, so here you can see uh, the, the system is this is a fixed sensor that is mounted here, and this is a little box that connects the sensor to the internet. Um, this uh, location actually is within the 20 kilometer zone in uh, Odaka. Odaka is a small community uh, that is, uh, has been evacuated since uh, five years, and this spring, uh, the plan is for the community to return. Uh, as part of that, uh, this is a community center that is being set up by uh, Mr. Wada here. He's the leader of that, and he asked uh, for us to help him with, uh, with measuring the radiation at the community center. So, um, so this is an example of the system, and the, the driver for deploying the system is people that want to have that system on their uh, own premise to measure continuously. Uh, so I want to spend a few seconds to go into how that looks like. Um, so basically here, this is... Uh, uh, when you go on the web, you can see uh, the uh, radiation level coming from a specific location, and you can see it over time. Uh, fortunately, this is very, very uh, static. This is good news. But um, uh, you can go on here. Uh, the system allows you to put comments on here. This is very important. Lots of systems that, uh, 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 that have been put out don't allow people to comment or to interact with what is happening. So we allow interaction to happen on the measurements. Um, we're also currently working on a uh, mobile uh, app where you can see all the sensors that we have deployed and you can pick up your uh, sensor of interest. You can pick up a favorite sensor and you can keep track of specific sensors and you can put an alert level around that so that you get a notification if something uh, changes uh, significantly. Um, so we have been doing lots of measurements, but I also wanted to talk a little bit about what, what, how we're thinking and what, what are all the activities we're in. Um, when we started SafeCast, we, we were responding to the disaster. Uh, over time, we started to focus on you know, what are we trying to do, what, what, are, you know, what is the change we, we want to we bring. And we kind of codified it into the SafeCast code. Our main um, uh, principles when we do things uh, kind of keeps us together. So we we want to be open in anything we do. We want to Im continuously improve. We want to continuously encourage people to participate. We want to publish everything we know. We want to question everything we hear. We want to be uncompromising if we do something. We always want to be on, available. We always want to be creating, creative, uh, doing new things. 
also try to be as objective as we can, and uh, last but not least, we want to be as independent as we want to be. So these are kind of the, the philosophy behind, uh, behind the, the, the Safe Cars project. Uh, today we are a very international group. We are loosely organized, uh, I would say almost non-hierarchical. We have volunteers uh, in all uh, corners of the, of the planet, mostly connected through the internet. We have two centers of gravity, one is here in Tokyo and one is in, in the US. Uh, but I think that is changing rapidly. We're getting more centers of gravity. Uh, we have uh, Mamiya from Hong Kong. We have a very strong group now in Europe and uh, Taiwan. We have also a very, very strong group recently. Um, besides measurement, we have a few core clusters of activity we work on. We Obviously, you saw lots of hardware, which has to deal with software. But we also have a huge backend system where we store all the information, we visualize and process that. There's a whole uh, infrastructure that sits behind that. Uh, we have spent lots of time on outreach and education. Uh, we meet lots of people, we try to help people uh, to do what we're doing. Uh, we also have some uh, organizational logistical teams, specifically if it comes, uh, comes to connecting to, to communities. Um, we tend to be a little bit interdisciplinary, and uh, our kind of, this, this picture kind of came from uh, Joe Ito, who is one of our co-founders. Uh, <laughs> oh, and so we <laughs> that's how dis anti-disciplinary we are, right? <laughs> so, so you know the the, the 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 mind of the scientist and the the mind of the engineer and the mind of the designer and the mind of the artist. Uh, this is how the safe cost community works. You know, we we're, we 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 we're seen as a citizen science project, but. Uh, uh, there, there are lots of elements to the project that are non-scientific but have to do with how do you uh, translate things, how do you visualize things, how do you uh, connect, and how do you uh, deal with the, the non-technical parts of what we're doing. Another very important element of uh, SafeCast is that we're always open. Uh, our initial most important uh, step we made was is that whatever we're going to measure, we're going to make sure that the data is 100% open and available. So we used a Creative Commons Zero license, which is basically a public domain license, that says that all the data that our volunteers collect, the raw data itself will be available to anybody, and there is no uh, restrictions on that. Um, so what we did is, is we also said, you know, when people ask us, we always get this, the question, are you anti-nuclear, are you pro-nuclear? And uh, we have countered it by saying we are pro-data. And that is really what SafeCast uh, uh, tries to uh, stay focused on. Uh, the pro and anti-nuclear discussion is, is, uh, is highly uh, politicized. There's a tremendous amount of activity happening around that. But what we want to do is, is we want to focus on what is the data telling us? What are we actually seeing? And that is a very difficult path to walk. You know, it sounds so easy. We measure and this is the data. But uh, there has been a continuous uh, debate and struggle uh, for people to deal with actual defects in data. <laughs> and, uh, and we hope by continuing walking that thin line in the middle uh, to create uh, dialogues that are uh, hopefully uh, helping people to better understand uh, what, what, what we're dealing with. So pro data is one. The other thing is this power of pull. Um, the way we have organized the project is, is people measure what they want to measure. So uh, if you're worried about your own street, you can participate in the project and you can measure your own street. We do not look for people to measure your street, you measure your own street. And this power of pull is very important. The project has been growing because of that, uh, organically in locations where people tended to have need for, for measurement. A uh, very important principle. The other way around is, is you decide where you want to measure, and we want to make sure we measure what is relevant to people, and only that. Um, another principle we use is uh, deploy or die. Um, our project has gone through tremendous amount of iterations. Our equipment we build, we have you know build, uh, learn, build, learn, relearn. Uh, so this can only be done if you go out and you test out what you're doing as quickly as you can. So when we went to Koryama in our first drive, we immediately learned a lot about the radiation levels, but we also learned about how can we improve the way we're measuring. So as we were going out with the next round of, of equipment, we made one step forward, but we also learned how to make the next step. Uh, this sounds kind of logical, but um, if, uh, if your background is, uh, like myself, engineering or science or whatever, uh, you tend to sometimes think too much and don't, do, and don't act. So SafeCast really wants 
uh, volunteers to go act and learn and don't wait uh, till endless uh, perfection has, uh, has, has come to us. So uh, Joe Ito calls that, you know, if you want to innovate quickly, you have to reduce the cost of failure. And I think uh, uh, that principle works really well for us. Um, another thing that made SafeCast possible is a tremendous amount of change in technology. If you go five years ago or even ten years ago, ten years ago there were no smartphones. Five years ago, uh, for example, low, low energy Bluetooth was were just emerging. Lots of the technologies that we use in SafeCast, like cloud computing, uh, the whole maker community, 3D printers, Internet of Things, uh, big data, geomapping tools, all these technologies are available, but they're also available to citizens uh, as open source projects or at very low cost. So because we had all of this stuff, we could put it together and we could create a very powerful project. Personally, I think that this would have been impossible 10 years ago. Very, you know, in five years ago, these things were just happening. And today, even when we look at what we can do today, we're already so much further than where we were five years ago. Um, another thing which we, people always talk about, Internet of Things. So we're kind of an Internet of Things project. But um, we learned that uh, the Internet of Things, having data that comes off devices that we can broadcast on the Internet, doesn't really have any meaning unless we build a community around the data. And uh, that community is important because if the data has no meaning for your existence, why would you collect it? Why, you know, it's great that we can collect data and put it on the Internet. But we saw a lot of projects that just did that. Uh, we call, I call it kind of device-centric projects. You know, we have devices, and we're excited, and we connect them, and there's a lot of data. But when you go look at the data, there is no community around it that translates that data into something that has a meaning. So in SafeCast, we, we have spent tremendous amount of uh, effort, and uh, as we, well, after me, talk about lots of things that we have been doing around the data that creates a meaning around it. So and I think if you talk about the Internet of Things, then you can, you know, there's also an Internet of Nothing. So unless you build meaning around the data, it is uh, not going to be very uh, uh, meaningful nor, nor uh, last very long. Very important part of SafeCast are people, the community itself. So uh, these are two very famous SafeCast, uh, SafeCasters, uh, Joe and, and Kiki. And uh, a key part of, of, of SafeCast is a lot to do with people teaming together, learning from each other, and having a good time. Uh, so. In order to build communities, we have a physical community and we have a virtual community. And we use everything we can. You know, we use a tremendous amount of social media and all kinds of social media tools to connect. Uh, we do workshops, we do discussion groups, we reach out, uh, do talks, presentations like today. Um, and we spend a tremendous amount of time um, uh, with media as well. And um, besides that we use social media, we have spent a tremendous amount of time with the, the, the printed media. Uh, that have more often uh, uh, over the last few years came to us to just get help about understanding what is happening in Fukushima. We have explained this tremendous amount of uh, journalists uh, also try to understand what our project is doing and that's educating. The media also helped us to collect tremendous amount of, of uh, uh, information because we got so many questions that we started to uh, document all the answers that we, we found for that. A little bit about how, how do we actually fund our operations. Uh, we are largely dependent on, uh, on donations. Most of the, the, the money we use goes to equipment and uh, action in terms of measurement. Uh, we have a few uh, larger funds that have provided funding for specific parts of our project. We get individual donations, but the biggest donation we get is people's individual time. And the biggest part of that is our volunteers measuring uh, with the equipment they have to collect the data. So it is, an, it is on one side we have you know, f financial needs, but the, the biggest contributor that has, uh, has made safe costs possible is funding in terms of people's own time. I want to talk a little bit about impact of the project. Um, this is kind of a very famous uh, uh, map. This was kind of the first map that we saw in about May 2011. This was based on the data that was collected by the helicopter from the US uh, government. Uh, but this is the format in which we got it. It was a PDF file, or actually a JPEG or something. And there's no data here. It's, it's, a, it's the data visualized, and you can't, you can't drill down, you can't zoom out, you can't do anything with this. And the, the, the measurements have been characterized in six color levels. So there's no graduation in between. So this is kind of uh, reality uh, check 2011 May. Um, same, uh, uh, same can be said of uh, systems that were built in Fukushima. Uh, the government built lots of uh, measurement systems to measure radiation. 
the problem is, is that if you actually go and look up what those systems are measuring, you will end up uh, going through tremendous amount of drop-down lists to finally find the sensor near your house. And when you find it, you also find out that you can only look at one month of data or a couple of months of data. Uh, so very hard to use. Uh, information about foot measurements and other things, uh, lots of spreadsheets and tables, lots of different uh, uh, measurement levels, you know, not comparable data. Uh, this, uh, for citizens, is extremely hard to, to figure out, you know, what do you do with this? Um, just to give you an example of, uh, of the, you know, the leverage of coverage, this is uh, the official government map 2014 of an area, I think this is Koryama or? This is in Koryama. We just zoomed into a specific street in Koryama, in Fukushima Prefecture. Uh, this was the data that was collected by the, uh, the, the, the minibus that you saw at the beginning of the presentation uh, that gave about 120, data, 120 measurements in that area. Uh, this is uh, the, the measurements done by Safecast volunteers, and we have 800 uh, measurements in that same area. This gives you kind of an idea of what is the power of a citizen's uh, science group. You know, as citizens, we can do a whole lot more if we start focusing on it. And we don't really have to count on the government measuring at all. We can, we can actually uh, enable ourselves to do that uh, uh, if, if the need is there. This is a map that um, uh, OSPI has put together by stitching together a tremendous amount of information available at the exclusion zone. But funny enough, you can't really um, find an official map about the exclusion zone uh, to date. Initially it was 20 kilometers. Today it is a patchwork of specific areas that still have very high levels of radiation. So this is a map we publish now. So if you want to know what is the uh, exclusion zone uh, today, then uh, this is how it looks today. Uh, there have been many, many um, other groups that over the last five years have come to us and have used our experiences to do their own projects. Uh, for example, in the US we have been, from very early on, we're talking about uh, a group called uh, DARPA, or we have been working with universities and other groups that have used the kind of the safe cost way of doing the safe cost code and have applied it to their own uh, projects and uh, data collection efforts. Um, last year, uh, over the last two years, we have spent more and more time with young people, students, high school uh, students, university students to teach and, and share what uh, we have done uh, as a citizen science project, specifically teaching about radiation, about uh, building Geiger counters, or how do you uh, work the open source space, all the elements of the project. Last year we did a uh, course at Aoyama University uh, for credit for students, for about 15, we did 15 full classes, 90 minutes each. Uh, I must personally say that uh, was quite of a challenge and uh, us being standing next to me did, did a good part of the, of, the, of the work. But what was interesting is we also used streamed, uh, recorded the, the sessions and we made it open uh, open courseware, you can go on YouTube and you can see the classes yourself. Here you can see this one of the segments, the 700 people actually saw that segment. Uh, so so we, we're trying to broadcast as much as possible to younger generations as to how can you learn from the project and how can you apply that. Another small milestone that is up and coming, uh, you know, we're a citizen science project, but lots of people say, yeah, but you know, you're not a scientist. Now, well, that's gonna change. <laughs> So uh, we have worked on our first scientific uh, publication, and uh, it's not published yet, but we have been, uh, we got the notification that the paper has been accepted after the peer review was uh, closed. And uh, as we went later this, sometime later this year. Okay, not that far in the, in the far future. So, so this, this paper talks about the safe cost method and uh, explains some of our, our, our learnings in that. So, even though we never made that a goal, it has become now uh, interesting enough for scientists to study actually how it works. Uh, this is Asbi um, uh, talking at the IAEA uh, conference in Wien. Uh, we were invited as a keynote speaker to talk about our, our project. Uh, again, we're sharing uh, what we're learning, but we're also getting noted more and more by organizations that initially we thought never would talk to us. And uh, that dialogue has been very, very positive. Uh, we don't uh, want to uh, polarize or put uh, uh, groups or people in corners. We want to uh, share how we work. And we hope that the pro-data uh, uh, mindset that we have starts to take root in other organizations. And we're seeing that other organizations are very, very carefully listening and start starting to change the way they, 
they think about that. This is another thing that recently happened. One of our volunteers became a congressman in Taiwan very, very recently, and on his inauguration speech in the, in, in the Diet, he talked about using the safe cost way of thinking to uh, deal with environmental issues. And this is, he is, if you look carefully, this is a big Aigi Nano he is showing to the Diet in Taiwan. This happened about a month ago. Uh, so, so outside, you know, people starting to, to talk about these things. Now, before we go uh, further, we talked about, you know, that anti-disciplinary picture with the spelling mistake in it. <laughs> it had the word artist in it. Well, I never thought that I would be an artist because of making a gag account of it. In 2011, we were part of an art uh, a technology festival and we were invited as artists to, to show our, uh, our, our big Aigis. Um, more recently in Taiwan, there was a, an exhibition where uh, Safe Cost was featured as one of the uh, one of the exhibitants. And most of our old big Aigis, even though they're broken and don't work anymore, uh, they have found their ways in museums. So there's one still in Italy, I believe, in a museum in Italy, permanent exhibition. So um, in 2013, uh, we reached a milestone where we won the uh, Good Design Award in Japan for Safe Cost uh, as a project, including equipment. It was a great. Uh, acknowledgement uh, for, from a design point of view and uh, the way we had organized it to get uh, the recognition and the good design award in Japan is a is a, a major uh, uh, award to to get um, we've talked a lot about radiation measurement and uh, as we were running the project lots of people said yeah radiation is interesting but what about air quality and we said well you know what about it and um, initially we had our hands full with uh, dealing with the, the problems here but we have started uh, about two years ago to see if we could take the same thinking and apply it to, uh, uh, to air quality measurement. Uh, lots of trial and error. Uh, so we talked about, you know, go uh, uh, deploy or die. We had tremendous amount of die on this initially <laughs> and uh, not so much deploy. And uh, that's okay because, uh, you know, you don't know what you, you set out for. And uh, so more over the last few months, we have made some good progress uh, though. We have built a few uh, prototype systems to measure air quality, and um, we are testing these right now, and we are gearing up to start some of the deployment. Uh, the system we put together will measure uh, PM, particle, particulate matter, uh, 1.0, 2.5, and 10, and it will measure three uh, uh, gases, and uh, four gases, methane and uh, the gases that are here, nit nitro oxide, etc. So th the idea here is to uh, do what we did for, for radiation, but apply to air quality. It's a very different uh, phenomenon to measure uh, than what we did radiation, but we're trying to apply the same way of thinking and see how we can create a citizen science uh, version of, of doing this. So I hope to have more news of that in uh, next year's uh, Safe Cost Conference, uh, and hopefully uh, we'll have a map uh, of, of the, the data that we will have collected by that. Okay. Um, I, I talked a little bit already about, you know, this is not a device project, this is not just data, this is about community, but this is also about better understanding what happened. Uh, for lots of people that participated in the project, it was about understanding, are we safe, is, is our health okay, what about our future generations, etc. And we got tremendous amount of questions almost from day one. And in the beginning, we had no clue whatsoever <laughs> how to answer all these questions because they were very, very difficult. But because we had built up a network of scientists and, and experts, etc., we put them all on a Google discussion group and we just threw the questions in and we got tremendous amount of feedback and lots of heated debates, etc. But what was great is, is we, had, we have a network where we can ask difficult questions and get answers. And uh, we've been doing that ever, the, the, ever since the beginning of the accident. And uh, about a year ago, it's so a little bit more than a year ago, uh, we, we realized that the FAQ, the Frequently Asked Question List that we have on our website, was kind of one, only a small part of the accumulated know-how that we had. And the accumulated know-how is really a network of people. It is a tremendous amount of studying, trying to understand, uh, journalists that come and ask lots of questions, people that send us emails with questions, all of that accumulated, started to uh, uh, create a, a body of know-how. And what we did is, is uh, a year ago we said, why don't we write down all of that in a report so that you can, if you want to know where, you know, what we have learned, then here it is. And let's write it in a way that is human understandable. Let's not write it for a scientific journal, but let's try to do our best to write it so that it's easier to read. 
And in that, we try to really focus on what is the best information out there that we feel is credible, that we can reference, uh, either uh, in, in the Japanese uh, press or in the foreign press or Japanese researchers, foreign researchers, Japanese uh, action groups, uh, overseas action groups, just put it all together. And uh, what is kind of the, you know, the, the, the reader digest of, of this? The information that is available today is actually uh, mind-boggling. Every day there are new articles, new publications. Uh, TEPCO itself actually generates lots of data. Japanese government generates lots of data. Researchers generate data. Uh, people, groups like us generate data. There's actually a tremendous amount of things happening, but it is very, very difficult uh, uh, for an ordinary person to make sense out of it because you need to go read all of it. So if you want to uh, do the shortcut of that, the safe cost report is, is for that. And after this, Asbi is going to take a few of the highlights out of the report. Uh, and the report itself is almost finished, or I think we have a, the, today we have a printout with this. This is the executive summary, it's just finished about an hour ago, <laughs> just in time. Uh, on, uh, on Tuesday, we have a small press conference at the Foreign Correspondents Club where we are going to officially uh, uh, announce the, the report. Uh, and we're working on a Japanese translation as well, which we hope will be available shortly after that. Uh, that's been one of the big things we've been working over last year is to translate all of this uh, in, in, into Japanese as well. Uh, before I give the word to Asbi, I would like to uh, uh, say one, one, or, one or two more things. Uh, one is, is that we are a volunteer group, and I know some of you are, are volunteering with us. Uh, we need you. Uh, our project is a project you know, for us, for ourselves. If you're interested to help out, uh, come and talk to any of us uh, after, uh, after the presentations are, are over. What can you do for us? It's a wide number of things. Very simply, if you want to contribute and collect data, that's where most volunteers start. If you want to help out in hardware or software, we have tremendous amount of things to do. If you want to help out in translation, if you want to help in uh, uh, coordinating with volunteers, if you want to help out uh, uh, researching data that we have collected, there are so many things where we need help. Uh, it, it, I can't stop talking about it. <laughs> so, so if you're interested, let me know. Um, the final thing is that uh, next month, uh, April 23rd and 24th, is exactly five years ago uh, on the day that we had our first Bigaigi come into existence and our first drive to uh, Koryama. Because of that, we're going to do a special workshop here in Tokyo. Uh, so if you're interested in building a Bigaigi, uh, do come to the workshop. It's a two-day workshop, so you can pick either a Saturday or a Sunday, and uh, we will do it uh, here uh, in, in Love Work. Uh, to uh, mark the occasion uh, that the designer, Jürgen Westerhoff, who made the uh, original uh, uh, design for the Big Aggie, he made a special uh, version, fifth, fifth anniversary version, so if, you're, if you want to have that one, you need to be fast. So there's only very few of those. Okay, so uh, thank you very much. I would like to uh, give the word to Asbi. Asbi, please. Uh, thank you. Yes, as uh, Peter said, um, this is the executive summary of the report. It's about 16 pages. Uh, the full report will be about 70 pages. Uh, it'll be online uh, by Tuesday, and uh, we hope to have some printed copies made up as well. Uh, so actually, I want to sort of ch uh, change the monitor situation here before I start. Okay. Yeah. So uh, yeah, that's the Safecast report. Uh, it's a lot of work, um, and. Um, you know, a lot of people have input. It comes from, uh, you know, finding information and discussing it both with our volunteers, uh, you know, here and abroad, and also with lots of experts uh, overseas on, on different things. And, uh, you know, part of not being pro-nuclear or anti-nuclear is that we talk to people on both sides. We talk to everybody. And, uh, and it's a good thing. Not many groups or organizations do that, uh, but it's been very, very helpful for us to help avoid bias. So um, 
part two of the report, the first part would be basically what Peter was describing, you know, what's happening with SafeCast. Part two is what we call the situation report, what is happening. And I'll just go through, um, you know, a bit quickly uh, and cover a few of the main points. So one is what's happening at Fukushima Daiichi. And uh, uh, last year we, you know, we presented some similar stuff and there will be some, uh, some uh, uh, repeats of some of that, but um, <laughs> They have a timeline for decommissioning the reactor. And um, basically, uh, the timeline goes you know, from uh, present time uh, until 30 or 40 years from now, when they're hoping to get all of the melted fuel debris uh, removed and everything done. But really, no one can say when that's going to be. Uh, because um, it, this isn't something that's been done before, really. Uh, Three Mile Island uh, was, you know, the fuel was removed from that. That was back in the 1990s that was completed. It's hard to know. Um, we're about right here now, 2016. Um, you know, if you actually did this to scale, this would be really, really a long thing. I think I'm going to do that, actually, make a, a graphic. Uh, but basically, they're on schedule. TEPCO is moving slowly on a lot of things. Mainly the reason they give is to, to help keep the doses to their workers as low as possible um, because they have to get into the reactor buildings and, you know, find the fuel and um, it's, it's kind of risky for the workers' health. Uh, and meanwhile, they're inventing a lot of the technology to do it. Uh, so um, basically, one of the big issues is the water on the plant. And uh, these would be the diagram of the reactor buildings. Their big plan is to build a big frozen wall. And this plan has been uh, you know, underway for a couple of years now. Um, it will be about 30 meters deep and will surround uh, the, the reactor buildings when it's completed. The idea is that that will keep the water from, from flowing in. And it's really like a dam. The water's coming down. This will stop this water here and uh, there's water leaking into the buildings and they can pump that out and keep the levels. Well, it's not working as well, of course. It's a risky, ish, a risky idea from the beginning, but you know, it's, um, it's unpredictable. The water underground is unpredictable. Uh, for instance, they built a, a wall along the seafront here uh, made of steel pilings, and the idea was that once that was in place, that would stop the water from leaking out into the port and they could pump it out through these pumps. These are pumps locations. There's a lot of pumps here as well. Well, the water levels rose a lot more than they expected. Uh, it was very, very uh, salty, and uh, they were unable to, it had a lot of tritium. They were unable to really treat it like they thought. So it, it's just that, uh, you know, it is unpredictable. The current plan, and again, the Japanese government uh, gave them, didn't give them permission yet to build the whole thing, to freeze the whole thing. It's in place. The machinery and the pumps and the stuff is in place, but they said, okay, if you're going to start freezing, just freeze this side first. And then they will gradually freeze more and more of this on the other side as they understand what happens to the, uh, to the water. And it's going to take a while. You know, it'll take a few months to freeze it. Uh, and again, there's no guarantee uh, that it's going to work very well. Uh, meanwhile, they have a very uh, kind of elaborate system for filtering the water that comes through the reactor. So basically, groundwater is leaking into the reactors, uh, into the basements of these big concrete buildings, and uh, the melted fuel is there. The water gets very contaminated with cesium and strontium and other uh, radionuclides. Uh, but they also need to pump water in to cool it. So what they do is they pump this contaminated water out, and they run it through two through a couple of filtering systems to take out the cesium and the strontium. And it looks like these actually work pretty well. Uh, and then this goes through to uh, desalination, where the salt is removed from the water. Uh, and then some of that gets pumped back in to cool and gets recirculated. And some of it, again, it's got this, the strontium and cesium removed, goes to some tanks, and then <laughs> comes back to these other uh, systems that take out lots of other radionuclides, uh, but they don't take out the tritium. And there's a lot of tritium in this water, and so they are, have been keeping it in tanks. And, you know, they're kind of running out of space for these tanks. Uh, it's, it's interesting because uh, 
the IAEA has said, has said years ago, they think it would be okay to release that water with the tritium into the ocean if they do it in a controlled way and carefully. Uh, the Japanese government, the uh, NRA, the Nuclear Regulatory Agency, has said the same thing, says go ahead and dump the water. Go ahead and dump the water. And TEPCO basically has been resisting. And this is unusual. It, it might be kind of like professional wrestling, where you know, they're just sort of acting this out and then they'll just do it. But um, the main thing is that the fisheries cooperative, the fishermen uh, don't, uh, won't accept uh, to have this water dumped yet. But gradually they've been accepting more and more. I kind of think maybe this year we may see the first tritiated water dumps. I have no information on that. That's just, just my hunch. So uh, the water problem is big and it's taking a long time to solve. And uh, unless that gets solved, they can't move forward with the other issues, which is basically getting the melted fuel out. Now this is kind of a complicated drawing. Uh, this is pretty much what the reactor looks like. They think the fuel melted out of this pressure vessel into something called the pedestal. This is a big concrete ring that this steel pressure vessel is on. And this is inside of this big kind of an inverted light bulb, big concrete and steel structure. So they think it's down here, right? Um, but they, they don't know for sure. Uh, but they think it's down there. So they have to get a way to, f to look in there. And they've used something called muon scans. Last year, this had just been done a year ago, uh, this one scan. And this is inside unit one. And you can, can't really see this very well. But if the fuel had been up, the pressure vessel is here. If it had been in there, this would have been dark. But it's not there. So they think, well, it fell out. Uh, obviously, it melted out. But they can't see the bottom with this. Then another group from Nagoya University also did scans of unit two and they compared them to scans of unit five, and unit five actually still has fuel in it, and this is the, the spent fuel pool. There's fuel in the spent fuel pool there, and also in unit two, and they compare it, and they say, well, looks like there's nothing in unit two, which is basically confirming it. Now, interestingly, they released this again about a year ago initially, and then in September, they took a long time to analyze it, and they said, yes, we're pretty sure that there's no fuel inside the uh, pressure vessel of unit two. Um, but again, uh, you know, it's hard to tell just from that. Um, this pedestal area I mentioned is down here. The whole idea is to get some robots or something in there with cameras to see. And um, it's too radioactive for people. Um, fortunately, there's lots of penetrations for pipes and things they would open up to put machinery in when they are working uh, with the reactor. So they've done, I think, actually a pretty good job of figuring out where to do that. For instance, there's one over here with a rail for some machinery they would put in. They, they've designed robots that will fit in the pipe, and maybe you've seen it. They, they're long and cylindrical. They go in, and then they unfold like a transformer, and they go around and, and measure radiation and take video. Um, but what What's not in here is there's a catwalk in this level, and they have gotten onto the catwalk of uh, Unit 1 and, and gotten some pictures, but they haven't gotten any images down here yet. It's full of water. Uh, they need to find a way uh, to get a submersible camera down there to look. I think this year, later this year, we'll probably see some results of that in Unit 1. The other uh, reactor buildings are much more radioactive, even Unit 1. This is sort of a dose rate map of the floor where they need to work on unit one. And uh, you know the blue areas are not so bad. They, they're like this range, one to 10 uh, millisieverts per hour. Now that sounds like a lot, right? But they, a guy can go in there, they can do teams working 10, 10 minutes or 15 minutes uh, and come in and out and get some stuff done. Uh, but there's some parts that are as much as 5,000, so five sieverts, especially down on this corner. So a lot of the delay now is because they're trying to decontaminate the places inside the reactor building where they uh, need access so they can get the robots in. Uh, and it's taking a long time. There's lots of delays for that. But I do think we'll see some uh, progress later this year. Um, a lot's happening with the evacuees. Of course, the story of what's happening in Fukushima is largely the story of uh, evacuees. And uh, the numbers have uh, been gradually decreasing. Uh, last year, uh, we reported 121,000 
evacuees were still not living in Fukushima, had stayed away, uh, had not come back. And uh, back in uh, December, it went below 100,000. And as of uh, last month, it was like 99,000 evacuees. So little by little, uh, some people are returning. Most of these are the voluntary evacuees, the people who weren't legally forced to move out, uh, but did it because they were worried. Some of those people are coming back. Uh, and again, the evacuees, there's about half of, well, a little more than half, 50,000 or so, are evacuated in Fukushima. So they went from some place like Koryama to Aizu, for instance, uh, or from some place like Soma to you know, Fukushima City. Uh, and then about 43,000 of them are outside. Uh, little by little, uh, the evacuation zone is being made smaller as they're opening towns for people to return. Uh, so far, there are, um, there are, excuse me, um, I need my notes. <laughs> three villages have been reopened, three parts have been reopened. Now the town of Tamaro is kind of big, only one part of it was within the 20 kilometer zone, and that part was opened uh, back in 2014. The same for Kawauchi. Uh, this would, had originally, originally been in the green color. Uh, this was opened. There's a little part that's still left. And the town of Naraha, last year, last September, was uh, reopened. And that got a lot of news because most of these, these two towns, there was only a small portion of it was evacuated, but Naraha, basically everybody evacuated. So when that was opened, the government made a big PR push and there's a lot of news about it. Um, now what's going to happen is um, by the end, by this time uh, next year, basically, by the end of fiscal 2016, by spring of 2017, everything you see in green and orange is due to be reopened for, for living. And uh, some will open pretty soon. Minami Soma has areas here. Peter showed a picture of uh, Odaka, that's within this area. This green and orange part of Minami Soma are due to be reopened in May of this year. And so they're getting ready for that. Uh, and the town of Itate, of course, is a big, it's a big issue, um, you know, because it was seriously contaminated. They're really decontaminating now. Most of the people in town, half of the people in the town are protesting the reopening. There's a lot of issues with that, but they're planning to reopen that within a year. We've seen these schedules get pushed back, so we wouldn't be surprised if it takes longer, but the basic schedule is, and this is decided by the government, this is basically decided by the LDP, uh, their team who's working on this issue, they decide the schedule and they want people to be back uh, by this time next year. So, um, the environment, uh, of course, there's a lot happening, a lot of uh, effects on the environment, a lot of radiation in the environment. You know, this is our map just sort of showing basic dose rates. Um, this shows some things, but it doesn't show everything. Uh, it doesn't really show the measurements in the soil. It doesn't show what's happening in the water. Uh, it's very useful. It shows a lot about what uh, people need to be concerned with. There's a lot else to know. Last year, um, I showed this diagram. Uh, the issue is, um, it was impossible to really measure directly when the accident was happening, how much radiation was was being emitted into the environment. But afterward, you can, scientists can go back and measure what's on the ground, measure what's in the dirt, measure what's in the water, and kind of back calculate this. It's the second best uh, method, but they're doing that. And there's a lot of good scientists working on this, and they have ranges. So, you know, in terms of what was going to the atmosphere last year, I reported this range from 23 to 50 petabecquerels. Uh, this is basically just cesium-137, so an equal amount of cesium-134 and lots of other things like strontium as well. Uh, and these numbers to the ocean, etc. cetera. Um, more recently, one of the better oceanographers who has been doing this kind of estimate is named Aoyama. And, uh, and his new estimates, he's gradually refining his, his team. And most of these scientists are agreeing more and more. That's important to know. So, He's thinking it's a little bit less than this. It's in the middle range, low range of this, et cetera. He thinks the amount that went direct to the ocean is a lot less than this, uh, but it's still a lot of contamination. And as everybody knows, 80% of the radiation, radioactive releases uh, went over the ocean, 
basically, and ended up, most of it ended up in the ocean. Uh, and what does that mean? So this is a map from Woods Hole uh, Oceanographic Institution in uh, Cape Cod in the United States, and we have a very good relationship with scientists there who have started their own crowd, uh, crowd-funded, crowd-sourced me- measurement uh, program. So it might be a little small to see, but in 1990, the North Pacific was four becquerels per cubic meter, okay? Uh, and closer to Japan, it was three becquerels per cubic meter. This is mostly from uh, nuclear bomb testing. Uh, but also some from Chernobyl. The influence from Chernobyl was more in the north, Baltic Sea, 125 becquerels per cubic meter, the Black Sea, 52 becquerels per cubic meter. The Irish Sea has the, uh, the Sellafield nuclear processing facility, which has been leaking since basically the 19. 50s or 60s, and really leaked a lot in the 1970s. Uh, it was 55 becquerels per cubic meter then. Uh, we go forward to 2008, before the Fukushima accident, and uh, we have levels of uh, 1.9, about two. It close to Japan, a uh, little less than two. Uh, to, you know, closer to North America, and uh, basically, the uh, oceanographers, and again, they're agreeing on this, they think that um, the ultimate levels throughout the Pacific will be an average of about four. So in other words, it's going to double what it was before the accident, but still a lot less than in other parts of the world from Chernobyl, and a lot less than it was after uh, the uh, nuclear testing period. The thing is, when the accident happened, just a lot of very contaminated water. Um, Here I'm putting 100,000 becquerels per liter. Uh, So you multiply that by 1,000, you have uh, many million becquerels per cubic meter of contamination was going out in the ocean close to Fukushima, close to Daiichi. Uh, And it peaked in April of 2011. And then gradually this is dispersing. And there's this continuing leakage happening uh, through the bottom. Uh, but over time, uh, by 2013, the levels, you know, even 30 or 100 kilometers away, were down below one becquerel per liter for most of this. So um, it actually decreased pretty quickly. And this is because there's a strong current. The Kuroshio is just taking this stuff across the, the Pacific and it's spreading out. Uh, so this ongoing leak. These leaks from underneath, they're, they're serious. It, it's keeping this area contaminated, but a recent paper I looked at, and again, it was very well done, says it'll take, at the current rate that it's leaking out, it'll take about 500 years for that to equal what happened in March and April of 2011. So it's not that the leaks are small, it's that there was so much that came out in March and April. Um, so this is uh, showing some of the results of uh, putting that steel wall uh, near the port of Daiichi I was talking about. This is looking at strontium specifically. So before the wall was being made, you know, they were having um, these levels of you know, 200, 300 uh, becquerels per liter of strontium. Uh, then they got the wall mostly uh, in place and uh, you can see it decreased rapidly. Uh, whether or not this is going to continue is another question, but it decreased rapidly. And then this is the water level behind this steel wall we're talking about. So it was down here, and then it just went up. Uh, and then they started the pumps working, and it went down again. But then, you know, they're trying to learn how to pump it out enough, you know, to keep the water level down. But the good news is that uh, the strontium levels are kind of low, but I think there was a typhoon right here. And uh, boom. When the typhoons happen, that just flushes a lot of, uh, you know, cesium and strontium and other things into the ocean. The oceanographers actually are getting a better and better idea of how much gets into the ocean when there is a typhoon. Uh, this is off the coast, coast of North America, and again, Woods Hole is uh, monitoring this, and also a group um, at uh, in British Columbia at the University of Victoria, and uh, basically uh, the first detections of 
uh, cesium from Fukushima were like in the end of 2014. And then last year, um, well, in December, uh, basically a few, about, about 1,600 miles west here, uh, they detected cesium at a level of, a, of 11 becquerels per um, cubic meter, which is more than you know they had uh, estimated beforehand. But again, it's not happening everywhere. There's like this warm plume, uh, and it's sort of keeping it together, and it's not hitting the coast all the same time. They've detected it in many locations. These places with a little dot are places where they basically um, detected it, but um, the white ones, they didn't detect anything. The yellow ones was basically low, uh, below two becquerels per cubic meter, but they did find one spot, like I said, that was 11. So it's pretty similar to what they were predicting, but again, you know, this is a big learning experience for them as well. Um, more about the uh, decontamination issue. This was last year showing what had been decontaminated by pretty much the end of 2014. So the thing to keep in mind is they're not decontaminating everything, but they're keeping track of you know, the non number of houses they decided they would decontaminate, farm fields, public facilities and roads, these were the percentages, you know, 60% uh, of the houses, 70% of the fields, 77% of the public facilities, and 36% of the roads. Uh, and uh, the bottom here are outside of Fukushima. There are um, about 60 uh, municipalities outside uh, of Fukushima, et cetera, even in Chiba and in Guma and other places that need decontamination. And so this was uh, what it was a year ago, and this is now. They're making slow progress with the ones outside of Fukushima. They're not that contaminated, and they're making, you know, again, you can see the progress. We'll go back to last year, and this is this year again. Um, so you can see the progress, but it's kind of slow. A big thing to keep in mind is that they're not trying to decontaminate the forests. And there's a lot of discussion about this uh, and what, what that means for people's life. Um, basically, it's technically possible, but it will be very expensive. I'll show you an estimate in a minute. This is Tamara. Tamara was one of the earlier towns to go through the decontamination process. This is 2013. This is a map of one part of Tamara this, these are the valleys and the, where the towns are, where people live and the farms, etc. The white represents forest. Basically, 70% of the parts of Fukushima that were affected were forest. So uh, not to decontaminate the forest is, is a big thing. And there's been a lot of discussion. Uh, Greenpeace, for instance, issued a report. They're talking about the imp implications of this. Um, the cesium, etc., will stay in the forest for a long time. Uh, it's sort of recirculated uh, by plants, by the trees, by animals, so it'll stay in the forest for a long time. So at this point, um, if they're not going to decontaminate the forest, that means people will have to limit their time in the forest. And of course, one of the nice things about living in Fukushima were the forests, right? And, and being able to have a lifestyle that depends on going to forest and either for recreation or work, uh, lumber industry, uh, mushrooms, all these things were really, really some of the most beautiful parts of life there. The reality is that the forests are not scheduled to be decontaminated. Uh, they've kind of given up on it. But um, I think we will likely see in future years certain forests uh, where the lumber industry could benefit from it or where other uh, the businesses uh, could benefit for it or where, where it's good for recreation, we may see uh, some decontamination in those places. So anyway, they're decontaminating all over Fukushima. Uh, and you've seen photos, it, they're cutting tree limbs, they're pulling up bushes, they're stripping dirt and putting it in bags. Uh, and there have been reports uh, in the media that there are nine million bags of decontamination waste in Fukushima. And the plan, and we reported on this last year, was to make what they call this large interim storage area around Fukushima Daiichi. So this is Fukushima Daiichi. Here's the town of Okuma. Uh, here's Futaba and this huge uh, facility with landfill, uh, incinerators, 
to, to turn some of this you know, wood and leaves into ash that can be put in casks, uh, processing facilities and a lot. Well, this plan has been being developed for years now. And uh, you know, I think the actual site layout, this was in you know, mid-2014. Um, they have not made a lot of progress with this. Uh, one of the issues is they have not been able to get the land, uh, both because they can't find the landowners and because um, some of them have refused. They've done some tests of moving some uh, of these bags of waste to certain parts uh, here, and it's like less than 2%, I think, of the 9 million bags or so they need to move. So they've made some tests, um, but in the meantime, they've started to use something called the Ecotech Clean Center. And uh, this is, I guess you could call it a stopgap measure. You could also call it a kind of pilot program. This is actually in the town of uh, Tomioka, right near the border of Naraha. Uh, here's the Joban Expressway. It's on the western side. This was a um, normal landfill that was being used for 10 years for normal waste uh, before the disaster. Uh, and then the government was able to uh, uh, get use of it for uh, radioactive waste. And it's not that big. Uh, compared to this uh, big site in, you know, uh, that they're trying to build near Daiichi, it's less than one-fourth the size of that. It's a very, relatively small, but they can test their techniques and they're moving stuff here. I think it'll use uh, about uh, 600,000 cubic meters of the two million cubic meters that they have, so they're planning to use it. But, you know, lots of problems involved with, um, you know, getting the permission, getting the approval, uh, uh, how they communicated to the communities. Uh, it was kind of done in a hurry uh, and kind of without drawing attention. Uh, and my sense is that the governments, local governments, Fukushima government, central government, they are trying so hard. They do not want any more delays for finding places to put this waste. So I think a lot of things have been happening to avoid public notice and uh, you know there's certain uh, uh, citizens groups that are monitoring these issues and are speaking out against this and and every time uh, there's discussion of putting uh, a waste dump or an incinerator in a town there's always an outcry and a protest and people do not want them there and of course you can understand that uh, about the cost of the decontamination, last year we reported uh, in 2011 the government estimated 1.15 trillion yen, uh, although uh, a, a researcher, um, uh, Professor Oshima from Ritsumei Khan in 2014 said, nah, it's going to be more like 2.5 trillion. Um, so more recently there was a very good paper uh, a colleague called attention to by Professor Yasutaka um, who went through and did a very detailed you know, analysis of how much everything was, how much needed to be done, and he gave a range of 2.5 to 5 trillion uh, yen, depending on, you know, do you compact the waste, uh, do you, you know, leave it uh, big, do you, you know, different, different issues, but more, certainly more than the initial estimate, and he went as far as uh, estimating what it would cost if they decontaminated the forest. Like I said, they're not going to, it doesn't look they will, but $16 trillion. And um, this becomes a very pragmatic, uh, you know, thing. Is it worth it? Uh, will it save enough uh, of the, um, you know, uh, radiation exposure? Uh, so it's a lot of money. And, uh, you know, these are being, these are largely economic decisions and political decisions. Um, again, about um, the environment, you know, there's lots of researchers studying what's happening to animals. I say lots. Compared to the number of people studying what's happening to humans, there's only a few. And there have been several studies, some of you may have heard of, uh, researchers studying butterflies. They found some mutations in butterflies. Uh, interestingly, those mutations disappeared after a year. Uh, the next, after a year after the disaster, they were gone. Um, some researchers studying birds. There's a guy named uh, Tim Mousseau who's been studying birds and other animals. That we know him pretty well. And this was interesting. Uh, this was released um, last year in August. 
Uh, this is actually researchers from NIRS, which is the government research laboratory, uh, saying they have found uh, mutations in fir trees. Um, fir trees, normally they have a central stem and all the branches go off of that, but they found uh, many of them in the highly radioactive areas, they, they split into this Y shape. And this can happen for other reasons, not radiation, uh, bacteria, just normally, but they found that there was more of them in the high radio highly radioactive areas. Similar findings have been made in Chernobyl, uh, so this shouldn't be surprising, but what is very interesting is that this is the Japanese government, the government research laboratory, uh, publishing this paper. So this, you know, there's been a certain amount of denial about this sort of thing, uh, and the fact is, it's hard to prove this kind of thing, right? It's very difficult to prove it scientifically, but this is the Japanese government, so that was notable. Another interesting uh, thing that happened, I mentioned Tim Mousseau, who's been studying animals in Chernobyl, especially birds and small animals, also insects, and he's been doing a lot of research in Fukushima, and he has, uh, his findings have uh, said that um, populations of certain birds have declined uh, in, in radio, radioactive areas and that there are mutations, uh, feathers, the colors are different and problems with eyes and things like that. And again, um, the other researchers, uh, a lot of other researchers depend on models and there's one particular model called Erica, uh, which for instance Unscare used when they did their report uh, what's going to happen to the animals and they ran all these numbers through this model that simulates environments and animals and they said well Not much is going to happen and of course people like Mousseau said you know this is you know, outrageous uh, They were very antagonistic for years. They've been antagonistic for years, but last year these two teams started to work together uh, because they understood each one can improve what the other one's doing. So if the field measurements that someone like uh, Tim Mousseau are doing can be checked against the, uh, the simulations, then they can improve the simulations and vice versa. And they work together, Jacqueline Garnier Laplace, who's from the French uh, radiation agency IRSN, and some of her team, and Tim Mousseau and his team, they work together and they found. Uh, they said, yes, you know, basically we have confirmed that what Mousseau has found is actually true. And, um, you know, they, they find uh, uh, what's called damage to reproduction and they find uh, fewer numbers of birds, et cetera. This was big news. This was also November last year this came out. So this is good. Uh, it, they, this has not happened in a long time. Again, the researchers are as polarized as everybody else, uh, but this is good news that they're finally working together. Um, this is uh, from a graph from the IAEA from probably 2011 saying, what's gonna happen to the cesium? And the, uh, the blue line is the cesium-137, and this is how it decays slowly over time. This is to 30 years. And the green one, rather the, the pink one, is uh, cesium-134, which decays much more quickly, two-year half-life, and this green is the, is the uh, combined. And basically, it was saying around 2014, it would be down to about half. Uh, 2018 would be 70%. Uh, we're here now. Uh, five years later, and um, the most recent uh, surveys from the government, the aerial surveys, uh, show about 65% decline overall. Now, this again, they're flying over the mountains and the forests, and as I was saying, the forests are not declining as quickly as valleys and places that can be decontaminated, so, um, you know, the implication is, of course, the decline in uh, towns is, is e even more. So and I think that's true, and I think our data tends to support that. But it's going to take time. And uh, again, decontamination doesn't get rid of uh, radionuclides. It just moves them somewhere. Uh, and when they get weathered out, they get washed out with the typhoons or whatever, they end up in the rivers, the, uh, the ponds, uh, or in the ocean. So they're just getting moved. And uh, this is really going to take a long time. And I think people who live in Fukushima, young people, understand this, basically. Uh, this is a problem that, uh, you know, teenagers now, as they become adults, uh, will have to be dealing with as adults, and their children will also be having to deal with it. So, um, to move forward, some food issues, and, you know, sorry, I have a note to myself, redo this. I didn't put in the data from uh, last year, 
But um, basically, the food testing has been very consistent. Um, the food testing program, even the skeptics, even the anti-nuclear groups, uh, the independent testing labs, they all basically agree that uh, the government has done a pretty good job with its food monitoring. Uh, and uh, not much food with radiation is getting through into the market. They're testing a lot of food before it gets to the market. There's still a lot of farmland which is kept out of production, uh, but it's working pretty well. And the most recent rice data, official government rice data, uh, whereas in 2012, um, they measure every bag of rice uh, and it was only 71 out of 10 million bags which was a percentage of something like 0 0.008 in 2012 but since the last two years it's been zero. It has actually been zero. Now there are bags with 50 becquerels and there's bags with 25 becquerels. So, but again not a lot uh, but it's been very effective in terms of the rice. Similarly fish looks like it's been very effective. Um, Generally speaking, officially, fishing is, is um, the fish that are caught off of Fukushima are not allowed to be sold on the open market. But there's a lot of types of fish and other seafood, octopus, that they have been uh, checking for several years, which have not had uh, measurable cesium for a long time. Fishermen are allowed to, t to, to catch those things and sort of sell them locally. Uh, on a kind of test basis. Uh, but they are being tested, and again, the, lo the levels are very, very low. There was a very interesting independent research paper that came out about a month or so ago, uh, which checked the probability of finding fish that, was, uh, that had measurable cesium, and they said it was effectively zero. Uh, now, that doesn't mean there's none, but they're looking at the numbers that are being tested, and looking at the numbers that come up with cesium, they're saying it's basically close to zero. Now, it's interesting, uh, we, we have stayed in touch with and developed you know, relationships with other independent you know, citizens groups. There's one, uh, the Mina No Data group is a, it's a group of about 30 uh, independent food measurement labs all over, all over Japan, and uh, uh, Mr. Ishimaru, uh, who has the uh, Kodomo Mirai testing lab in Kokobunji is a good friend of ours and we send stuff to him to test and they, they release, you can go to their website and they have it in English as well and you can search by time and location and, and find out what they're measuring and I just did a quick search for rice measurements from the past year uh, and uh, from Fukushima and several came up and all of them are, are not detected where this is actually a little bit detected, right? But uh, but very, very, very low. And uh, generally, the people who are coming to these places to test stuff, they're testing things that have grown themselves or that they went and picked, like mushrooms, etc. There's another uh, interesting lab called Iwaki Sokutei Shitsu, uh, which is, um, they use the name Tarachine, and they're very uh, s technically sophisticated and they test also dirt and vacuum cleaner dust and some of that is surprisingly radioactive actually. And one thing people should know is even if the air dose rate is low, the dirt might be contaminated. And uh, you know, it's not surprising to find dirt uh, all over Fukushima with you know, 10,000, 50,000, 100,000 becquerels per kilogram. Uh, and some of the dirt they find does. So these are sort of food tests and I know it's very small from there but you know, of all these things that they measured, in uh, January, uh, only a handful of them came up with any measurable uh, cesium. Most of them were way below 100 becquerels, but this here is some, uh, what is it? It's, it's, a, it's a fruit. Uh, what? Oh, it's mushrooms. Mushrooms. So not surprising. Uh, and it's good that these facilities are here, but as we talk to these, uh, the independent testers, you know, they know they have to continue, and a lot of them are now concentrating on soil measurements uh, because they need to have a check. Uh, but uh, they all generally agreeing that, yeah, the only things that show radiation are things that people are growing themselves, and it's good that they have places to check. Um, to talk a little bit about health, and I may go through this quickly again. Um, so again, this was last year. At this time last year, there had been 109 uh, cases of cancer detected in children, thyroid cancer, 
in children in Fukushima, and that was the preliminary screening, which was a little more than half done, uh, and there, the second round had just started, and they had found eight, and as of February this year, uh, the number, uh, the first round is basically completed. Uh, they are 116 who they suspect of having cancer, and generally, after they have an operation to check, pretty much most of them, almost all of them, are shown to have cancer, so it's up to 101 confirmed cases. And then in the second round, which is about 60% completed, uh, 51 suspected cases and 16 confirmed cases. And um, I'm sure this was in the news. There was a, a researcher who wrote a paper who said, this is the beginning of a big outbreak. Um, researcher from Okayama University, and uh, he did a big press conference uh, to show his results, and it was all over the news. Uh, and instantly, all of the experts in the world uh, basically said, no, he's wrong, and uh, for a lot of reasons. So um, his paper uh, was published in the journal Epidemiology, and it got seven letters, uh, you know, critical letters which is a large number to begin with, seven uh, refutations. But in them were 20 people signing them all together, including all of the world's top thyroid cancer specialists. Uh, they all said, no, he's wrong. Uh, he's misinterpreting the data. And uh, last year I talked to a person a little bit, Dilwyn Williams. Um, he, um, we've been talking to him since 2012, asking him to interpret the information. Uh, he was one of the people, he put together a team along with Keith Baverstock uh, when they heard reports uh, in Chernobyl that children had thyroid cancer. And uh, the governments and WHO, they said, no, it can't be true, you know, it, it's the Soviets, they're lousy, uh, you know, whatever, record keeping. But uh, they went and checked and said, no, no, it's true. And uh, he is actually a thyroid pathologist, which means he looks at the cells, looks at what's happening to the cells, and he said, yes, this is due to radiation. And everyone still said, no, it can't be true, and he fought. Uh, it took about 10 years, but uh, he fought and the others fought and succeeded in getting this accepted. And now everyone knows that it's true that children can get thyroid cancer from exposure to radioactive iodine. Uh, so we talked to him. And in fact, I was in Cambridge last week. I was in uh, London for some other work, and I took a day trip and spent a lot of time with him. Uh, but, uh, and I'll just go through this quickly. This is um, from his own slides. Um, the main thing is, um, you know, younger children have a higher risk from radioactive uh, you know, radiation-induced thyroid cancer. Uh, and what's happened in, in uh, Fukushima as opposed to Chernobyl, in Chernobyl, this, these are the ages that people were, children were, when they were exposed. In Chernobyl, it's very clear that the youngest children, the one-year-olds over time, had the, the more, more thyroid cancer. It showed up in them first, and there was more of it, and it declines with age. In Fukushima, there's been none of them under five yet. Not a single one under five. So that's one sign that it's probably not radiation. Instead, it's the teenagers. And, uh, and Dylan Williams is pretty sure that what we're finding is actually the normal uh, thyroid cancer because we're screening for it. And, you know, it's, it's not an easy thing to say. No one's going to say it's definitely true. But again, the doses that uh, children in uh, Fukushima got uh, seem to be 10 times or more lower than in Chernobyl. Uh, also, uh, the kids in, in Chernobyl were iodine deficient. And this was well known. They didn't have enough iodine in their diet, so their thyroid glands just sucked up as much radioactive iodine as possible. So they got very, very large exposures from that. And uh, so Williams says, you know, these factors combine to predict a relatively small increase in thyroid cancer frequency in Fukushima Prefecture with a longer latency. He's saying it's too soon. The other thing is that the latency period, the time between the exposure to the radiation and the cancer developing, you know, again, it's not set in stone. They think it's at least three years, five years. That's what they would expect. And this is from a lot of experience, both with Chernobyl and with people who've had iodine treatment for various other, other medical reasons. So um, he thinks, yeah, it's too soon for so many, uh, but 
you know, uh, it's likely that we will see in future years some increase in thyroid cancer. So this is a big debate going on. But um, uh, again, people make a kind of an assumption that because, uh, you know, there was a lot of thyroid cancer in children in Chernobyl, when uh, children in Fukushima are found with thyroid cancer, it must be for the same reason. But if the, the, the specialists and the experts, and again, someone like Dylan Williams, is really unbiased. He, has, he doesn't work for the government. He doesn't work for the industry. He's very unbiased. He's actually 89 years old and still working uh, and very brilliant. Um, you know, people who have no reason to try to uh, downplay the effects, uh, these experts are all in agreement that what we're seeing in Fukushima is not uh, yet, so far, is not due to radiation. But this, again, the idea that it is, is just out in society, there's, you know, documentaries, there's, you know, magazine articles, uh, a lot of people uh, really think it must be true uh, and sometimes get angry when I, for instance, tell what report what someone like Dylan Williams, Dylan Williams reports uh, because you know you think we're trying to cover it up but in fact uh, he thinks he's pretty sure it's not and uh, for a lot of reasons it's the biological plausibility he understands clearly biologically what has to happen before a cancer will develop he says those conditions are not there yet in Fukushima knowing that the initial doses are still uncertain. You know, it's, we can't say for sure how big the initial doses were because not enough kids were actually measured, uh, their thyroids, thyroids measured in the first weeks after the disaster. But even with that, he's pretty sure. Uh, so, uh, and the other thing is that um, thyroid um, surgery, you know, it's low risk, but there is risk. And uh, just screening everybody, you're going to find a lot. You're going to get a lot of people having surgery. And in a lot of cases, the surgery might be worse than, uh, than leaving it alone, a lot of these. Now, what they found in Fukushima children so far, it looks like the surgeries were a good idea. They were not these tiny, tiny uh, tumors. They were kind of aggressive, uh, small tumors. But um, you know, it looks like it's a good idea. So this is going to be going on and on. And everyone, the experts, uh, the critics, uh, knows that if it's going to happen like it did in Chernobyl. In Chernobyl, the, 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 the rate seemed to increase a little bit in the first four years after Chernobyl, which is probably because people were reporting it more. Uh, the rates were lower than Europe uh, before that, and then after four years, the, the levels seemed to be about the same as the rest of Europe, so it looks like they were reporting more, and then they shot up. Uh, and, you know, hundreds of cases per year. Uh, so in a couple of years, we'll know. And uh, it'll be terrible to find out, but uh, we'll, we'll know. Uh, anyway, uh, I'm going to try to wrap up quickly here. But uh, so there's other screening going on, uh, whole body screening for internal contamination. This was last year's numbers. This is Fukushima Prefecture's program. They've measured, you know, almost 300,000 people now. Uh, all over Fukushima. Uh, this was the rate last year. They measured 238.5 thousand. And 238.5 thousand had no detectable internal cesium. Now they're up to 281 thousand, and again, there's only a few that they found who actually have it. There's a lot of problems with Fukushima's reporting, though. They don't tell what the body burden is, how many becquerels per body, how many becquerels per kilogram. They don't have that information. Uh, other programs from different towns uh, in Fukushima, Minami Soma, Hirata, uh, even Iwaki, uh, many towns, they do that. These are run by the local hospitals, by the local government. Um, they report it much better. Uh, but Fukushima Prefecture basically only seemed to be interested to know how many were getting more than one millisievert a year. Uh, but this has always been a problem, and actually, uh, I think it will continue to, to be a problem. This is from municipal uh, programs, particularly this is Minami Soma, and uh, this was last year, and this is this year. So as of last year, for the last couple of years, the children, uh, and they've, they've started to use a very sensitive detector for children, uh, they've had none. And there's, this is thousands of children, uh, you know, 4,000 or so. Uh, measured and the adults is gradually declining. In 2011, more than half the adults had measurable internal cesium, and almost 48, 40 percent of the kids did. Uh, but it went down very quickly because they were counseling the, the families about food, uh, and it's gone down very quickly. And it's not zero in the adults yet, but it's still a very low number. Uh, again, to compare the uh, 
what they find in, uh, you know, what Fukushima Prefecture reports as opposed to some of the local governments, uh, they both report what they think the dose per year is. And most of them are saying they're not finding people with more than, uh, not finding many people with more than one millisievert per year, but all the rest, how many becquerels per body, how many becquerels per kilogram, are they testing people more than once? Are they trying to find who has high risk? Are they testing the food? When they find someone with contamination, do they go to their pantry and measure it? The local governments are doing this, not always and not you know every time, but this is what they think is necessary. Fukushima Prefecture just says, we'll measure you, we'll mail you the results, uh, we'll tell you if you have more than one millisievert. Um, again, this, uh, I was looking for new data for this year for suicide, but there has been a small increase in suicides in Fukushima. Uh, again, it's lower than some other prefectures still. Uh, but uh, it has been a noticeable increase, and the data that we had from last year showed it's primarily in men and women 20 years and under, and then men and women 80 years and older. Uh, so you can imagine the older people, a lot of these people, they've lost their family, they're evacuated, they lost their community. You know, life is, is pretty miserable for them. For younger people, I think it could also be family problems, uh, and then just worry about the future. Um, so, uh, finally, uh, on one more after this, the cost of the Fukushima Health Survey is again, you know, we don't have a lot of estimates. This, this screening program, the thyroid and all this other stuff, it is about uh, a trill, uh, rather a hundred billion yen, and it's going to be going on for, for years now. They will continue to test the, the, the people who were children at the time of the disaster uh, through their adulthood and it'll go on for a long time. This is a, a big, big cost, and of course, it costs more than the government thought it would. One last thing, um, back in October, a worker from Fukushima Daiichi uh, contracted leukemia, and he was awarded compensation. And this uh, has been reported in the news a lot. Um, you know, this is the first worker from Fukushima who, uh, who has been accepted as having a radiation related, a work related cancer. And uh, it's important to know that the guidelines say that any worker who gets more than five millisieverts of radiation exposure per year and gets leukemia any time in the rest of their life, they qualify. They will qualify, and this was an important test. Now, the thing is, um, it's impossible to prove that this person's leukemia came from radiation. Uh, it's impossible to prove, and what this is saying is that TEPCO and the government is saying it's not even necessary. You don't have to prove it. Uh, you will get compensated. So this was an important precedent, and there's several other people who are also apparently who have applied for um, compensation, uh, and they very well may get on. This person worked at Fukushima Daiichi for only one year, uh, and then um, you know was back uh, working somewhere else a few years later. Uh, he was in his 30s while he was working, now he's 41. So some time passed. Uh, it's biologically plausible. What I was talking about for the thyroid cancer in terms of latency and exposure and those rates, um, the experts like Dylan Williams and everyone else, they say it's not biologically plausible. Uh, but in this case of leukemia, it is. The, the, the latency is about two years, and there have been some very good uh, studies, long-term studies of workers, specifically nuclear workers, looking at them for decades, showing that, yes, even fairly small exposure. Basically, they're looking at 20 millisieverts or so, uh, but it implies even lower, that there is a noticeable increase in leukemia in workers who even have these small exposures. So it is plausible. So this is the good news. Um, other thing to know is that I was looking for more up-to-date up information. In August of 2013, there were already almost 10,000 workers who had the five millisieverts. Almost 10,000, and I'm sure it's more now. It's at least double by now. Uh, and that means I'm sure we will see a lot more claims and a lot more people awarded uh, compensation for that. Uh, that's the end of my presentation. I know it was a lot to um, process. Uh, and we'll be, have time for questions and stuff later, I think. So thank you very much. So are we taking a break? Yeah, let's take a break. It was a long. People have been sitting for two hours. Take, take a stretch, get a drink.
don't need this anymore. Right? Uh, no, we can keep it as a backup, but in case you have a question. I can just turn it off. Um, so we can turn off the... Uh,